Stand up with the fear of God. Let us listen to the Holy Gospel, a chapter from the Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew, may his blessed. And go to the land of Israel, 
for those who sued the young child's life are dead. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. The first Sunday of the, of the month of Tuba, the fifth month, is always coming after the Feast of the Nativity of our Lord. And it's always commemorating the flight that our Lord had taken with his mother and Joseph to Egypt. This um, account in St. Matthew has two two points that we might look at today. The first point is the idea of running away. To run away, to, f to flee. Because the order came from heaven for Joseph to flee, to run away. And the second point is the point of persecution. That this king who was so envious and so scared, intimidated by the Lord, he wants to put an end to this fear, and he doesn't have time to waste, so he's going to kill him. And it's a very wonderful thing, actually. It's very interesting to see that the Lord of the creation is running away from a human. I mean, this is amazing to think about it. That God sends his son. He's a son of God. He has control over nature. He has control over everything. He's going to run away before an earthly king who thinks so much of himself. And he let him be. Someone asked me yesterday, why would God allow the killing of the little kids? I'd, I'd say maybe because this is our freedom that he doesn't want to touch. Why would he allow anybody to do anything? If God doesn't allow, then this will be the end of it. We will be in heaven. Whatever God allows and doesn't allow, it's heaven. But because we are on earth and there's other free wills, not just the, God, the will of God. And sometimes we, in our simplicity, think it's only the will of God. No. God works very hard with our free will. Very hard. Trying to persuade us. Trying to call us. Trying to bring us back to him. It's like the, the, the will of the, the prodigal son's father. He didn't interfere. We as parents sometimes, we start to use our force. We put the foot down, like the inside out would say. The foot down. Put the foot down and just make sure that the, the kids would do exactly what you want. Is that going to work? Never. Never. It never works. So God doesn't put the foot down. Because God's foot is very heavy. So what does God do? Let people do with certain limitations. And so he allowed this king to do what he wanted. So let us first look at the idea of fleeing, running away. I mean, there was a time in, the, in, in America, maybe in, during World War II, maybe shortly after, it was the fashion for kids to run away from home. Maybe become 15 years old, for, even 14 years old, run away from home and just live on their own. And you start the, old, the whole hippie movement and all kinds of things. <clears throat> this is not it. The running away of our Lord is power. I'm going to tell you stories about running away. There was a righteous young man. He was a teenager. His name was Joseph, living actually in Egypt as a slave who had no power over himself. He had no 
control over his faith. And here comes his mistress, his, the, the one who owns him, and she wants him to have sin with her. What this young man says, he says no. And I think he had planned it already. He said, what am I going to do? I know exactly where the exit is. So she holds him from his tunic. What does he do? He leave it. He said, if this is all what I have, I don't need it. He ran out naked almost. Slaves didn't have much clothes to cover themselves. He ran naked, but he was not ashamed. There's nothing to be ashamed of. I better run away from sin than change and become something that I don't want to be. And he, in his answer, we studied this in the retreat, his answer said, how could I, I? So I would, I would wonder, what do you think of yourself? He said, I'm not an Egyptian. I'm not even an Israelite. I am the child of God. How could I do this thing and sin against God? He had to run for his life. He didn't wait and, and he would say, Lord, help me, help me, help me. And then what will happen? Nothing. So sometimes a person has to run. Have to run when things are overwhelming. And here in this case, the overwhelming point was sin. He didn't want to go into that place. David, when Saul, the king, got so envious of him and wanted to kill him, he ran, which is a very interesting story in the book of Samuel to read it. He ran to the same people that he defeated. You remember the famous story, David and Goliath, the giant? Goliath was a Philistine. So to run, out from, to run away from Saul, he went to the Philistines, to the king. And he went there to take refuge. He didn't want to kill Saul. He could. Two times in the Bible, it's actually mentioned that he was actually with him. One time in a mountain, was, David was hiding with his men. He was hiding in a cave in Engedi. So he was hiding, it was dark inside, and then they heard the, the hoofbeats of horses and men steps coming up the mountain. And then they, uh, they froze, everybody said, shh, don't speak. The, the cave was dark. And then here comes Saul. They could see because they were, <laughs> their eyes were adjusted, they could see it was the king coming in to go to the bathroom inside the cave. So David was standing behind him as he was doing this, and he took advantage of the situation, and he cut piece of him from his rope. So he couldn't see him. And then he left. So David came out of the cave and shouted, King, King, why are you running after me? And he said, who is this? I says, this is David. I am nothing. Why you are you care so much about me? Saul doesn't know that David is a king also. He's anointed. So he said to him, here, send somebody to take this piece of your cloth and look at it. And look at your own garment. So he looked at his own garment as a piece cut. And David said, why are you doing this? And Saul said, you could have killed me there. And he didn't. And he cried. But he went again and chased him. David was fleeing from Saul continuously. When he went to the Philistines, the king said, why are you here? He said, I'm running away from, uh, from Saul. He wants to kill me. And then his servant said, beware. This is the one who killed Goliath. This is the one who defeated us. The reason we are in this trouble and we can't go back to Israel is this man. And the man said, the king said, is it true? Is it true? You're the one who killed Goliath? He's, he started to get scared. And David acted crazy. He started to drool, scratch on the walls and the door to get out of there. Why? He knows he cannot stand against evil. David does not fight evil with evil. He's not going to go there and be aggressive and violent. He can. He has 400 men. He can help himself. And no, he's running away from evil. In the Old Testament also, you go back a little bit, and there was a very good family. A man who is righteous before God and his wife, and he has two daughters. And they were living in a very bad city, extremely bad. One of the wickedest city in the history of the Bible. And then he was visited by two strangers. And the strangers came to him and said, 
you got to leave. The city is going to be destroyed. And he said, why? It's nice here. He said, don't even argue, don't ask questions. You have to run right now. It's not going to be morning on the city. So he started to talk to his family and his daughter, uh, uh, son-in-laws to be, the, the fiance of his daughters, and they started laugh laughing at him. We have to get out of here. And then uh, the angels found them lingering. They started to pull them by the hands and take them out, the two strangers. On their way, the heart of the wife was not really into running away. She still had her heart back. So she turned back and froze. And they say, still till this day, this day, a, a pillar of salt, when the Bible was written, in that same place. She had half-heartedly left. She didn't really flee entirely. She got her heart stuck there. Come St. Peter in the New Testament and says, Beware that when you are trying to run away from sin, that you totally and completely flee. That you don't have a little piece of you interested in going back. Lest you will freeze and you will become stuck. And this is what we say always. People who have addiction know this the best. I need to have this 100% determination. I cannot have a 1% even stuck back in that place. I have to be completely out. And I have to put my head and my eyes straight forward. So when there is sin, when there is an addiction, when there is an evil, we got to have our heart on the run. So this is important to those of us who struggle with things. Your job is not to run physically. Nobody is going to ask you to run physically. But within your heart, you have to have that conversion and not to look back. We pray this piece actually at the end of the liturgy. I'm going to pray it loudly so you can hear it. So we say to the Lord, help us to flee to the end from every evil deed of the adversary. To flee to the end. To run away to the end. Because sometimes people know they need to run away, but they run half-heartedly. We can't do that. We're struggling with a sin, struggling with an addiction. Before it comes, please, make a determination, a resolution, to stay on the opposite direction and go as far as you can from it. It could be friendship. It could be friendship who brings a lot of damage to my life. It could be an attachment. It could be a TV show or a game. Some kids, like I say, usually tell me, I'm not addicted to electronics. I can stop at any time. I'm saying electronics is one of them. And I say, the challenge is here. Stop it today for a week. Now. And I say, now? Not now. This is the, the, the first point, is that we have as Christians to run away, to do some running away. Jesus said, be quick to reconcile with your enemy on the road before he gets you to the judge. And then once you get to the judge, there's no going back. So be careful that you do it before you get to the judge. Now, the next point is the persecution. Here, it's an interesting thing. Jesus is exiled from his home. Exiled. Who was exiled? Who were exiled? An exilee. The, the Israelites, twice, twice they were exiled. Why were they exiled? Because of their righteousness? Because of their disobedience, unrighteousness. They were punished by being exiled. It's simply because of this. When they were a people without a land, they went after God. And they were in the wilderness. Yes, they didn't have that much faith, but they fasted, they did whatever they needed to do. They were, in a way, okay. But once they become with a, the with a land, they started to change. And Moses told them that. What's the difference between a nation and a people? What, is the, what, what defines a nation? What makes a nation? Actually, what defines a nation is people with land. People with land. Then they are a nation. So when they became a nation, they started to go away and they got very comfortable. And Moses told them that you're going to plant vineyards, you build the houses, you get comfortable, 
and you're going to start going back from serving the Lord. And that's what they did. Once a person gets comfortable, it's not easy to know God. It's difficult. We want the ease of life, but the ease of life brings with it lack of faith and lack of service to God. Here comes persecution. So he said, I'm going to get, take the land out of you, um, of your hands, and then I will send you away to Babylon, and then another time to the nations, so you actually come back and seek me. But why is Jesus being sent away from the land? What's the point? Why is he being exiled? We don't know for how long. Why is he being exiled? So the Gospel is telling us he's starting from where we are. He's starting from where... I think he lived with the Jewish communities in Egypt who was not under the rule of Herod. He was living with them. They were living with the Jewish communities over there. And why is that? Because first, he's going to start with the exilee, the people who were outcast, the people who never returned to Israel. This is where he's going to begin his journey. And the second thing, to bless Egypt. Because there is a verse that says, Blessed are my people in Egypt. He's going to bless Egypt. By the persecution that he receives, we are blessed. And that leads me to think about how we are also persecuted. You might be persecuted in a school, or in a job, or in a country, or in a region, or whatever. God has a job for you. You're going to go and bless other places. You're going to carry him to other regions. It will not be very comfortable for you and me, but this is God's purpose. That's his plan. And you will look back after your life is almost coming to an end and say, I know, Lord, now you send me there because of this, or because of this plan that you have planned. So there's nothing that God does that is a waste. There's nothing that has no purpose. There's always a purpose. It might not be for you, and you might not see it today, but there is a purpose for it. When he said, because, he said, out of Egypt I will call my son. It seems like Egypt is the parking spot for people, for God's people. So when God wants to find a place for them to stay and to be, he sent them to Egypt. So, thank God that Egypt was blessed by the Israelites and then by the Lord himself who came with his mother and St. Joseph. It's the only country that he visited outside of Israel and not by his own choice. So this is the plan of God for all of us. We came out of Egypt, those who came out of Egypt, because of something, because of persecution at work or a study or something. And then we came out here. Why are we here? We need to ask this question. Why is this church, a Coptic Egyptian church, or any other ethnic churches in America, or in the West in general? That's a very important question that we have to ask ourselves. Why are you here? There must be something. There must be something that God wants from you. There must be a plan that God is actually doing in you. By you, He will bless lands and will bless people. Might be one person at a time. I remember this about the Lord when He says, You are the salt of the earth. The salt. Think about the salt. The salt is together in the cupboard on the shelf. But if the woman who's going to cook make a soup and she takes the salt from the shelf and puts it in the soup, what is the immediate next action? You get the salt and put it in the soup or the mulukhiya or whatever you want to do or rice. What do you do next? You stir it. What happens to the salt when you stir it? It becomes all over. All over. And it doesn't have the same strength because they're clumped together. No, they're not clumped together. They're meant to be spread. This exactly happened to the church by the persecution, and it's usually after a murder, a killing. When Stephen, the, the archdeacon, was killed in Jerusalem, 